Greetings, friends. And mostly enemies. Alright guys, just one quick announcement, and we're going to get into the video. Promise. So, as I already said in a live, I'm going to be endeavoring to read my entire debut novel, The Garden of Lies, for you here on this channel, starting today. Chapter 1 is already up. It's been up for a long time. We're going to be picking up with Chapter 2 today. I will link Chapter 1, um, you know, right right here. I think I think I can do that. I, I might have to do it in the description at the end of the video. It'll be linked somewhere, I promise. <laughs> so if you haven't read Chapter 1, or if you haven't heard Chapter 1, go check it out. And then new chapter is going to be up every Wednesday until we've read the whole damn thing. Uh, why am I doing this? Because I want everyone to be able to get my story. I honestly care more about the world hearing my story than I do about getting rich. Um, so do me a favor, start sharing these videos around, share the playlist with your friends. Um, the one bit, the one bit of bad news for you is because I'm giving it to you in this style, I'm not gonna bother editing these videos, and you're gonna get commentary alongside the book like if I want to stop and tell you like some fun little trivia I'm going to it's not gonna be quite audiobook quality sorry that that that's the give and take here <laughs> and for those of you who were unaware um, me Caitlin Noel and Katie Francis over at year the author we we're all launching our official um, channel together adventurous publications where we're going to be doing our live streams from now on we're not going to be doing the channel rotation it's going to be on adventurous publications that will also be linked hopefully here if i can do that if you know if i can't do it then i just move my finger around the screen looking like a jackass for nothing so yeah go subscribe there for the write-ins and the saturday night show and thank you guys so much for being here and growing with the channel. And uh, let's read some good-ass fantasy. The Garden of Lies, Chapter 2. It's just a story. Finalizing the modifications to the plan and taking a little input from my lieutenant, Pogs, the pack's plan is set. Elder starts wrapping up the ceremonies. The hunt begins shortly after the speech ends. Pax will gather at the north entrance to town, where we will have the option of hunting in the Great Plains, or the Avian Forest, or along the shores of Domingo Lake, named for a shaman who lived on the island in the center of the lake many generations ago. I scan the crowd, and I spot Arian. I'm analyzing him, trying to see... If I can gauge anything from his reactions to the rules. If anything, my suspicion is slightly validated. He does not seem surprised or worried at all. I'm all but sure he knew about the changes ahead of time. I wonder how he used that info. Was he using his free time to hide supplies in the field? Scouting out where the herds are roaming this season? With all that additional info ahead of time... He could have cheated in all kinds of useful and wily ways. I'm going to have to try to gather proof he cheated during the hunt if possible. He has no honor. He shames every fang in his pack by his despicable actions time and time again. And I've had enough. But an alpha has his priorities. Winning comes first. So... Mighty hunters, gather on the north road at the edge of town for the ceremonial sending, and your seven days of hunting can begin at last. Elder finishes his speech, and the crowd cheers. Arian begins walking north out of the square. Amnes taps my shoulder. I turn my head to catch her in my peripheral so I can keep an eye on Arian. I know Elder said no alliances, but truce? 
I think we can both agree Arian needs to lose. Amnes offers, bending the rules as usual. I offer her a smirk, and I wink but say nothing, keeping my answer ambivalent. I don't plan on sabotaging her to win, but it's not off the table in a pinch. Somehow, the feral, feminine smile she wears tells me she understands my thoughts. She turns, and her pack follows her north. Her pack is more woman than man, and while she's the most attractive, not one of them doesn't turn heads and drop jaws. More importantly, her entire pack is smart and talented in one area or another. Arian has the only other female selected our year. My pack is a sausage party. Arian enjoys reminding us with jokes about sexuality that somehow manage to sound highbrow while also being as crass as anything a stable hand would say. I think it's his vocabulary choices that pull it off. No time like the present, gang. We follow the crowd now moving north. It's a five mile walk to the edge of town. It takes us about an hour. We could cover it much faster but we have to wait for Elder and the ceremonials to catch up. No sense in rushing ahead. Walking along, I see an old man, small, stocky, poorly dressed, probably a free human, or a slave who has a master nice enough to grant him a break. He's sitting on a crate. Kids gathered around him. Some canines, some human. He's telling them a story. And I stand back. If I approached, I would likely scare him into stopping. But I perk my ears up and hear him just fine. The star people. They loved their world. But alas, the world was angry at them. For they had scarred and fouled it. So it summoned its fury from beneath the bedrock and erupted great clouds of ash and rivers of magma blotting out the sun. I've heard this story before. My father told it once. I had heard someone telling it in town much like this old man was doing now. My father scooped me up away but later finished the story at home. Dulge. Never repeat that story. It is taboo. Shaman can punish you for repeating it. And I asked why. My father would not tell me. He said I would understand when I was older. <laughs> and then he went missing shortly after I was selected for training. Along with Bomb and Pog's folks. And then Elder taught us some home skills and shacked us up. Roomies ever since. The old man on the crate continues. So, the star people were forced to build great boats. Boats that allowed them to sail into the sky. Where they could search for a new home. The old man has a knack for storytelling. All the kids were in frol The old man has a knack for storytelling. All the kids were enthralled by his tale. He put emphasis in all the right places, gestured with his hands. Even I was entertained. With childlike wonder in their eyes, they probe with questions. He laughs, answering them as best he can. I noticed the danger about 20 seconds before he... I try to warn him. Wave my hands. Point. To no avail. His attention is on the children. An old shaman and his shaman guard escort. A fox from the avian forest from the smell of it. They're approaching. The shaman is short and severe in appearance. Gray hair and eyes, tired, weathered face. His guard is tall as Amnes, but lighter in frame. 
The foxes fight with speed and cunning. She's pretty, but her beauty is as much a weapon as her twin daggers strapped to her thighs. She's wearing form-fitting black leather, shirt and breeches, that stop mid-calf and mid-forearm, with black leather lacing sandals to match, a silver chain anklet with a single sapphire mid-chain shaped like a teardrop is her only ornamentation. They know what the old man is doing. They move towards him with purpose. And I can only watch, dread growing in my gut. I tried to warn him, but if I take any more direct action, I risk punishment myself for aiding a criminal. He sees them as they step into the clear space behind the seated children who scatter when they see the pair. The old man has gone silent. His eyes gain a level of worry. But his features remain jovial and calm. He is cool and collected for a man who might die today. Do you have anything to say in your defense for telling that story today of all days? The shaman is a visiting dignitary, not from our town's council. He won't want to overstep his peers and execute the old man. I hope. I, I beg forgiveness, sire. It's just a story. The old man smiles politely as he says it. The shaman takes it as mockery. I would have you hanged were you in my purview, and were it not a day of celebration. You get the lash today. The old man bows his head and continues to smile. Thank you for your mercy, sire. There's a hint of sarcasm or indignation in his voice. The shaman doesn't notice or he would have killed the old man on the spot. I feel slightly relieved. This was the best possible outcome once he was caught. He will bleed, but he will live. The shaman signals to town guards who come to collect the man. Moments before the guards grab him, a short, gorgeous girl steps out of the circle of onlookers. She rushes in front of the old man and puts her arms out wide, blocking the guards. Please, don't hurt my uncle, she cries out, voice breaking, tears streaming from eyes green like shining emeralds. Her rust-red hair braided and lying on her shoulder catches her tears. Her oval, slender face twists in fear and worry. Her slender limbs tremble. Her simple dress, it's in good repair but dirty. And my gut lurches into my throat. She's making it worse. She might get them both killed. Angel, stop. There's no need to get punished with me. The old man now pleads. Damn it. Damn it. They don't deserve what's coming. Heresy or not, it is just a story. Just words. My parents' words ring in my memory. Humans didn't do anything to deserve their fate. And therefore, it is wrong that they suffer it. The music of the festival plays on. The smells of food and drink waft on the breeze. The guards grab the girl's arms and press her roughly, face first into the wall behind her uncle. Only now does his smile falter. He sheds tears. Not for himself, but his niece, who has earned a lashing right alongside him. 
Three more guards appear. The old man is pressed to the wall with his niece. The lashings begin, and they both cry out. Onlookers have mixed reactions of pity, contempt, smug satisfaction. And a select few, me and my pack among them, are angry at the cruelty of it. At last, seven of ten, I can't stand it anymore. My left foot steps forward on its own. My lip is pulled up on the left, exposing my sharp teeth. The fox has her eyes on me. She's ready to intercept me. The shaman watches the lashings dutifully. I am about to step into the circle when I feel a hand grab my shoulder. I turn, and Pogs has a vice-like grip on me. He shakes his head and mouths the words without saying them aloud. Don't do this. I turn my head away from him and the scene in general, tucking my chin down and to the left, shaking my head. My fists are clenched so hard I draw blood from my palms. I can't believe I'm letting this happen. I don't have any good choices. Intervene. Get lashed myself. And removed from the hunt. And possibly removed from warrior training. A great shame. Don't intervene. Let them suffer. Over a harmless story. Tears of rage flow down my cheeks, but when I raise my head and begin walking away, there is no emotion on my face. The tears stop seconds later. Elder Angio once gave me training in emotional control, part of the way of the mountain. It serves me now. I feel shame, regret, and guilt, and none of it shows as I walk to the ceremony of sending. Chapter 2 The Garden of Lies I hope you enjoyed it, guys. Tune in next Wednesday for Chapter 3. If you like the story so far, do me a favor. Like, share, subscribe. Share the video around. I'm going to put together a playlist just for the Garden of Lies chapters. Go check out Chapter 1 if you haven't. I'll see you guys next Wednesday. Be well, my friends.